Revolution and insurrection must not be looked upon as synonymous. The former consists in an overturning of conditions, of the established condition or status, the state or society, and is accordingly a political or social act. The latter has indeed for its unavoidable consequence a transformation of circumstances, yet does not start from it, but from men's discontent with themselves. It is not an armed rising, but a rising of individuals, a getting up, without regard to the arrangements that spring from it. The revolution aimed at new arrangements, insurrection, leads us no longer to let ourselves be arranged, but to arrange ourselves, and sets no glittering hopes on institutions. It is not a fight against the established, since if it prospers the established collapses of itself. It is only a working forth of me out of the established. If I leave the established, it is dead and passes into decay. Today there exists a basic contradiction in political thought. We all want to make the world a better place created narratives about what's wrong with it and what the problems are that prevent us from making it better. But the reality is that we can't really make the world into a better place through the lens of ideology on its own. Ideology is war, ideology is division, ideology is stagnation, and it will never make the world into what it needs to become. Which imagine for a second your political party was right about everything and that they somehow came to occupy every political seat in Washington DC. Sure, they can do a few things here and there to make the world better, but the world is a deeply complicated web limited by finite resources, limited by systems that are far from perfect, limited by our own will to change things as well. Political solutions on their own are going to run into a basic problem of functionality when they're forced to grapple with the deeper, real-world issues. So it feels to me that the entire game of politics today is looking for solutions that don't actually exist. And the reason for that is that we think the government is some kind of magical, transcendent entity outside of the limitations of reality that can fix all of our problems with the wave of a magic wand. The way ideology has warped our perception of reality is totally removed from the material existence and has us concerned with things that are purely abstract and increasingly distant from day-to-day -day reality. And really, that's all we're capable of doing at the moment, because political solutions to modern problems don't really exist. We as a collective certainly have the ability to make the world a better place, but our voices are so impotent and disunified currently that we cannot. In the current age of atomization, we often lose sight of the fact that we own all of this. Yes, the government makes the laws, and uh, growing your own parallel structures is hard, but there's nothing actually preventing us from, as a body of people, simply creating our own systems and using those to replace the existing ones. If we want to improve the conditions of society, this is the level of thinking we need to apply. Really, there's nothing stopping us from starting a revolution in this way. The only real and obvious problem with the plan is that I think a lot of people have fallen into this mindset of what I call confrontational defeatism. Uh, even though they talk big about government corruption or economic issues, they've actually taken a kind of consumer standpoint towards their own powerlessness. Uh, conspiracy theories are certainly an interesting avenue in terms of what can one can occupy their mind with, but I believe you reach a point where it no longer even very much matters what's true and what isn't. What actually matters is the simple question of where can I as an individual affect change? So I believe we have to start thinking of things on a different scale, otherwise all these current issues are going to pile up and have a cataclysmic effect when we finally have to face what's important in life. No waiting for the sky to fall, no us versus them mentality, simply an effort to push forward with what we know is best for us. And the way to do this is not in the macro approach to looking at society from the top down with powerful groups telling the rest of us what to do, which is a level that everyone is thinking of it right now, which exists as a kind of authoritarian impulse within the commons, but instead on the level of our own local communities, building their ecosystems up to become productive, healthy, and functional from the bottom up. This kind of manic ideation that we're going to just one day fix a system without organizing, without actual ideas that, func that further our functional material interests, is probably one of the most pressing delusions that exists within postmodern thinking. So what we should be trying to do instead is begin to put aside all the petty differences that make us separated and start to view the world as a large-scale project of functionality that respects the interests of all who contribute to it. 
rather than a plane of competing ideological faction. To make our own system, we have to begin to cooperate and build systems with each other and use the entirety of our energy as a society to build the things which give life its meaning. And if you really do some soul searching to try and figure out how to make the world a better place, you'll likely realize the very same thing I have that the biggest threat to society is in the slow and steady death of the potential we hold in the face of hopelessness. So my proposal for revolution is very simple. Unlike most kinds of revolutionary action, it doesn't involve any offense on the standing power structures. Rather, it is fundamentally constructivist and focuses on creating value instead of subtracting it. And this is how anarchism is actually supposed to work in practice, building on the power of the collective to create productive social structures that aren't authoritarian in how they exert their power. The last thing I want to talk about before I start outlining the exact plans is, though you may not personally like the exact methodology as I describe it, the end outcome to me of any successful revolution will have to be something resembling this, because ultimately to have better systems, we have to make better systems and live by them. We've seen the results of trying to have a society where governments and corporations sit at the helm while we mindlessly do their dirty work. It never ends well, because once individuals sit in seats of power, that power inevitably corrupts. But with collectivized responsibility, creating a system where everyone has a direct say in and understanding of the processes of the state, there's a drastic shift in the degree of corruption you'll see. As I said here, I think the very existence of politicians is an antiquated institution and there's nothing preventing us from using the power of the internet to replace the existing structures with a true democracy. Furthermore, apart from my own admittedly limited ability to spread these ideas, there's nothing really preventing us from executing them. So let me just put my whole concept here into one basic idea. We should take the United States government and push it somewhere else! Virginia Woolf starts with a simple idea, using the principles of localized power to enable communities to self-optimize and self-govern. Unlike a traditional protest, the main goal is not to be an offense to any existing power structures, but to begin to plant the seeds of our own. These are changes that we can implement to make the world tangibly better in ways that are small at first, but can build into a greater and greater effect as more momentum is gained. I look at the current government as something like a constrictor snake that's restraining us from activating our collective potential. And if you're fighting a constrictor snake, you don't struggle against it, but slowly detach yourself bit by bit until it loses interest. Essentially, we have to give ourselves our own sense of merit to make the existing government obsolete, creating the basis for a completely reformatted society. The existing government only has power because we outsource our own to it out of convenience. But if we can demonstrate responsibility over our communities, it will wither away. So I'm going to start with some very basic ideas just to get across the fact that communities working together can yield powerful results for everyone. Nothing too groundbreaking yet. Uh, so one thing that the modern society program does to us is say that we as individuals are meaningless unless we are giving our energy to the system as a whole. We serve the system rather than anything the system meaningly does for us outside of monetary compensation. One of the appalling results of this disjointed approach to economic formation is that we have something called unemployment, which is one of the most telling obstructions existing within this system. I personally believe that if one wishes to work, they should be given a complete guarantee that they can fulfill that duty and live in dignity for it. No one should have to be unemployed. So let's fix that. Let's say to every corporation, that our hours will be distributed in such a way that all those who are in need of more income can have a share of the existing hours, and those from whom those hours are taken from are given compensation for now having less hours themselves. This is a very basic idea and simple enough that anyone can understand the value of it. If there is unemployment and it is not willful of those unemployed, the individuals in the advantaged position of already having such employment gather together to abstain from work until adequate contracts can be drawn up for all people involved. Think of it as similar to a boycott, except with our own participation in the labor market as a stake being withheld. Obviously, without our participation, there can be no work done or money to be made, so by working together and refusing to comply with this systemic coercion, they pit worker against worker, we can permanently solve the problem of unemployment. 
and it's ridiculous that this exists at all. In most cases, there is really nothing preventing one individual from completing the tasks of one job over anybody else. So it's just a pointless competition we're herded into having. Okay, so you get that one. Next idea. Uh, everyone knows that the current gig economy is a fraud committed against working peoples. It's too reliant on tips to be fair to the employed. The work itself is highly unreliable. And apart from the job having no benefits, the employee also has to provide everything from the actual car to any amount of gasoline they use, in the case of like Uber. Um, so what if we flipped the gig, gig economy totally on its head and said, hey, since there's no real overhead provided by the company like you'd find in a normal job, we should effectively jailbreak the gig economy from its owners and bring control of it under our reign as using a decentralized system by and for the people. It would only take a small bit of investment in our own infrastructure to develop community-based systems that operate with the same basic principles as apps like Uber and DoorDash. In doing this, we're taking the power of technology away from the giant corporations putting it right into the hands of people so that we can begin to take the first steps of developing autonomy from institutions. The more power we can take from governments and institutions and take for ourselves, the more we can actually shape the world to be how we want it to be. So we do this piece by piece. Another piece of this puzzle is credit card companies. So the purpose of a credit card is, in essence, to provide people with a temporary source of funding if they ever need it. This is a lot of utility to the average American who is living paycheck to paycheck, should they ever want to make a larger purchase than usual. And they can slowly pay back the debt over time, instead of having to save up for a long while to make a payment. Well, we can, as people, actually come together to create our own financial safety nets. Now, I'll get to how this would be enforced later on, but essentially, all that we need is a combination of people who are willing to put up a bit of income they don't need at that time, offer it as a loan to any people who are having difficulty paying for all of their expenses. No one actually loses any money in this equation, and people who are struggling can temporarily pull from it to help themselves get back on their feet. Now, assuming everyone is able to get a job now with the prior program in place, and this steady income allows anyone to pay off a debt if they're in a tough spot, we can effectively eradicate homelessness in this way. All someone would need to do is take a loan and get a place to live, start looking for a job, and eventually pay off the debt. Anyway, so now that we're starting to build our own communal infrastructure by pooling our resources together, what's to stop us from taking it further and doing something more physical, something with utility, something that everyone can benefit from and appreciate the value of? Solar panels, for instance. For an individual, a solar panel may seem like a hefty investment. If a number of people are willing to front the bill together and also split the savings, we can start to slowly build a robust, a robust network of cheap and renewable energy resources. This will begin to reduce our reliance on the existing electrical infrastructure, putting more money in our pockets, and taking it away from electrical companies. Another useful idea would be to increase our local communication networks by creating community Discord servers. This could serve a great number of purposes such as, of course, allowing us to better organize these projects, act as a kind of omni-hub for any exchange of goods and services, or just as a general place for people to ask questions about the, the community, plan events, and so on. It's a small thing, but having it in place and used on a wide basis could really improve the general community welfare. It certainly can't do any harm to just have, and as we move on to later phases of the operation, it would only increase in usefulness. Last idea I'll suggest for this phase would be employing the use of a shared vehicle system. So it require just a little bit of a coordinated effort. Perhaps an app can be made to track the location of these vehicles, which we can attach an unremovable tracking device to. And this doesn't have to be just limited to cars either. We could do the same thing with bicycles or electric scooters, which are a very underrated form of transportation. There are many people who don't need to have transportation available to them on a daily basis, whether they personally own methods of transportation or not, and those who do can temporarily provide access to what they possess, and those who do not can make use of, it, of this system wherever it is needed and do not have to purchase their own vehicles. Obviously insurance is one small fee that we'll have to share, and gasoline should perhaps be paid for on a per-use basis. But if we could effectively split the costs on this idea 
and maintain a large network of different methods of transportation available citywide, the benefits could be enormous. They could vastly decrease the necessity of car ownership while making transportation cheaper for everyone. And apart from just cars, I have always liked this as a general concept. Like, let's say, for instance, someone wanted to do a video project of some idea they had, but they don't have any equipment. There could be a kind of communal resource where people can loan out their own equipment for when they're not using it. Same for any other kind of creative idea, or just any time someone needs to use something temporarily. Maybe like a lawnmower, or some extra TVs if they're hosting a Super Bowl party or something. We can accomplish a lot by spreading the usefulness of our own possessions, which may momentarily inconvenience people who loan things out often, but it could be made up for the fact that everyone will have a lot more access to all kinds of useful resources. The most simple application of this could be something like borrowing a stick of butter to bake with, or something from a neighbor just a block down the road. In general, this principle has a lot of potential to make otherwise difficult situations much easier and help reduce the need for overall resource consumption of people who don't necessarily need to own things to get the value out of them. Everyone pitches in. So at this point, now that we've got a hang of working together, if we want to, we can start to go further beyond these relatively simple ideas onto phase two. Now, I know a main concern many people have of these kinds of ideas is how do we prevent abuse of the system by those who don't share the same goals and good intentions as us? The answer is something everyone has thought about, but few have considered the potential applications of a genuine social credit score system. Um, something I think people who worry about this concept as being authoritarian should really think about is one simple fact. If we don't make a social credit score system ourselves, I do believe that someone will eventually make one for us. And should that happen, it would be out of our hands what negative impacts it may have. And this is not just baseless speculation. It has already begun to be used in the corporate environment. In the company J.P. Morgan Chase, they have now in place a very dystopian technology which uses AI to track and monitor employees' activities called WADU. And what it does is it actually creates an employee profile for everyone in their office and ranks them based on audio and video recordings, keeping track of things like whether they speak of their bosses positively or negatively, if they keep their emotions under control throughout the day, productivity markers that are calculated based upon the amount of input put into their computers daily through mouse and keystrokes, and even if they want to spend any time looking for other jobs online. This is a pretty new technology, but it's likely to gain further reach as time goes on and the technology develops. Now, I do believe there's a lot of problems with the social credit scores that have been put into effect by the likes of China. Of course, this is because their system of government does not have a great deal of democratic influence put into it, and also because it's very rigid in the way that it operates. I do think there's a correct way to use this kind of thing so that it doesn't make anyone's life much worse, and also enables a great deal more social fluidity within this system I'm outlining here. The first thing I would want to stress is that there is more emphasis on positives for people with high scores than negatives for people with low ones. I believe it is especially important to maintain this kind of a framing so long as it is in more of a trial period. I should say I'm not entirely opposed to a system which takes a more authoritative role, though the only way to effectively be able to do so would be through a very slow and comprehensive process which receives the consent of all people governed under such a system. This is an experimental concept, so it has to be employed at first with a great deal of caution, and always take the approach of a very focused, do-no-harm kind of philosophical application. And if it doesn't work, well, we can just democratically decide to scrap it or rearrange it to work better. You may notice what I'm saying here sounds a bit like the Constitution of the United States. And yes, the entire premise here bears many parallels to the movement of the original state's government away from Britain, achieving a state of greater self-governance. Except this time, instead of removing power from the monarchy as the primary authority figure, which was replaced by our current democratic republic, 
It's taking the entire notion of a centralized authority and completely replacing it with total democracy. People then had no choice but to submit to the monarchy. Now we have no choice but to submit to the present authorities and their vision for society. And I believe if there has ever been a time for this, it is now. Because if we do not strike while we still have basic freedoms, what I believe will eventually happen is that our power structure will become so clustered that democracy sees a total decline into a system which only serves one functional purpose, further enriching those who have a stake of ownership in the systems of control. So while an idea is potentially volatile as social credit scores does seem frightening now, we should also consider it a great asset if we can harness that power to work in our favor, and that power exists completely divorced from the existing powers. So, with all that said, let me explain some basic work and principles on how this might come together. So obviously, if we're going to start following through with any of the, these ideas, a big issue for many people is going to be whether or not they can trust each other. The existing institutions don't really require that as much because one, they have enormous resources and manpower to maintain security systems to prevent any bad actors from abusing their systems, and two, they have the long arm of the law to make sure they always get their due. But the only true way to be free of this kind of institutional complex is if we have our own ways to make sure that people follow along with what's required of them, because, let's be frank, there's always going to be selfish people in the world. So a basic way to start to develop a kind of systemic trust would be to create a kind of merit system. People who willfully make consistent and helpful contributions to the system would receive some kind of a badge of honor that other people could see and think to themselves, okay, this person isn't going to try and steal from me. People who often have disagreements with others could see their personal rating decrease, and certain actions taken which would be considered theft could see them cut off from the system completely. Perhaps people could have their own kind of a review page even, and you'll get to see everyone who's had positive or negative interaction with them make their points, and with every reviewer themselves being marked as either high, neutral, or low in trust rating. It'd be nice even perhaps to have a system that keeps tabs not just on whether people are contributing or leeching from the system monetarily, but also if they are the kind of person who might bully or lie to others regularly. And that's somewhat subjective, so it probably shouldn't be the most key part to determining whether a person can partake in the benefits of this system. I'm honestly not sure how complex a system like this would have to be, and there are likely people who could come up with a better system than I could, but ultimately using social credit as a tool, perhaps using the community discord channel as a means of organizing it, could be invaluable. And the more involvement you start to see with this, the more use there is that could be had out of it. When there's a baseline level of trust already pre-established for people, this makes it a lot easier to ent enter into any interaction without any worry that things can go wrong. Next thing we can start to do is actually take the reins of local seats of government and then start to use those seats of power not for their typical use of following with the vision of one particular politician, but actually for that politician once elected to act as a surrogate for whatever it is the people themselves want. If people want to see something built, whatever it is, they can democratically choose to tax themselves to raise funding to make it happen. We want an anti-homelessness initiative? Done. People want to repurpose some piece of land for some kind of community function? Easy. Maybe we want to develop a different kind of education system, fund it and make it happen. Obviously, we still have to adhere to certain national standards, and we can't just literally redesign every aspect of society, not yet at least, but we can do certain things to align reality more so with our own true interests. And that's a good start. We could even take the helm on what kind of infrastructure we want to see happen, hire public service workers to serve whatever purpose we feel is important, and so on. I think something like library-esque distribution centers, where people could rent certain more expensive things for use, would be a nice added feature to society. Not only would this save a lot of people money, but it would also drastically cut down on resource consumption. One cool idea I have in mind specifically is the use of 3D printers on a community-wide basis, which could be really fun for creative projects or good for mass-producing goods of our own even. So, to the contrary of the you will own nothing and be happy mantra, uh, it will be more like everyone owns everything and no one can take that away from you. 
and I believe in doing this, we could effectively make everyone on the planet by a realistic metric not necessarily tied to egotistical goals wealthy. Another thing I would personally like to see is a sort of streamlining of the organization of labor. This would require us to force the existing corporate structures to bend to our will somewhat. But as with all things in this project, if there's a will, there's a way. And this is where we would start to get into some of the basic concepts of a planned economy. One basic idea I've always been a proponent of is the idea of doing away with the 40-hour work week and just generally reducing the amount of man hours that are required to maintain the economy while maintaining the same approximate level of class and wages. Let me list a few ways we could accomplish this. Firstly, creating a dynamic digital infrastructure that instead of requiring people to constantly be working the same hours, uh, it would actually create work requests that scale with the amount of work needed. Uh, there are definitely a lot of jobs that have a static level of required labor, but things like the gig economy actually have made ample use of this exact idea. The main problem is that the corporate structure is overly rigid and doesn't allow for high or low tides of work to be allocated. I'm sure plenty of people can tell you that they clock in for work at the office just to spend a great deal of time... Uh, checking their email. So instead of working for X hours a day, I think a more effective route would be for employers to create a weekly checklist of things that need to be accomplished. And if this can be accomplished in just two days, then good for them, they can go home. Uh, currently, we are still dependent on jobs that are, as David Graeber just defines it, BS jobs. But this can change later on as the project continues to expand into the final phase. Certain jobs can be completely eliminated, such as waiters and fast food cashiers, to be replaced by digital systems. I'm also a fan of the idea of replacing a fair number of existing stores with a purely digital marketplace, which would reduce the amount of workers needed to keep the physical stores operable. It would be nice, actually, to have some kind of integration with Amazon so that they can integrate their infrastructure with our own systems. And to take this even a step further, I think we can move past the existing supermarket infrastructure to make stores like Walmart and Target to be totally digital. Walmart already actually has a system set up to support this, where you simply select every item you want to be delivered to your house from the store. The benefit here is that this massively reduces the amount of work required to maintain the Walmart store, reducing it to simply taking the products and gathering them to get together to be collected by a driver. Perhaps since some people are still attached to physical stores, there could be something like a preview store that exists where one of every existing product is displayed for people to look at, and if they like them it can then be requested to be delivered straight to their house. All of this, by the way, is just to reduce the amount of man hours required to maintain the local economy. And as the hours required to work go down, and the previous system which maintains that everyone be paid their previously held monthly wages regardless of how many hours they are actually required to work, and also guaranteeing that everyone actually has a job, we can slowly start to move towards a purely gig-based economy, essentially. So what this would mean is, anytime someone wants to work, they can simply sign themselves up to a digital queue list, and as soon as they do so, they would be paid upfront instantly for the, their labor contribution. Of course, if they, for whatever reason, don't show up for work, then they may see their social credit score go down, and they would see any future payments go back into paying the debt incurred that day. If it is desired, and we create a highly optimized system, we could even start to institute our very own universal basic income system at the price of a small tax levied on everyone's wages. Though this would not likely happen until we can actually get to automate more jobs going forward. But this is not at all an impossibility. Uh, in fact, McDonald's has themselves opened up a 100% human-free McDonald's store operated by robots. Anyway, I'm getting just a little bit ahead of myself here, but you get the point. Transitioning to an economy of minimized work without excluding anyone who potentially wouldn't be able to get their own job. So let's move on to the next phase. It's at this phase that sovereignty is truly established. I would want us to start sharing our own currency, sharing and even building our own housing arrangements, and also starting to generate our own value through practices such as shared gardens. 
though we don't have to limit it to just gardens. We could also, at this point, start pulling together resources to make our own businesses as well. Something people often forget is that the only thing preventing us from having our own co-op business structures is due to the lack of startup capital, which is why it's called, you know, capitalism, right? But anyway, one of the most useful models to combat the current capitalist system is with the creation of what are called parallel structures. And what that basically means is creating small pools of what you would be seeing in a functional society within the pre-existing society. Basically, I view the current system as being a non-consensual system of exploitation and expropriation, and though if we come together to create our own system, it may not be perfect, at least it will be better than what we have at present. If we were to begin, say, using our own non-taxable currency, instead of just surrendering our energy to the government, we can ourselves select what the best things our community can invest in on a basis of consent. Obviously, one good thing we can start to do is develop some of our own food supply. Maybe not everyone necessarily wants to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but it's obviously a net positive if we can just have the gardens spread all throughout the area for people to have free access to. I've heard a few times before that many cities have actually intentionally made it impossible to cultivate produce publicly, or even removed plants that produced food that already existed for the sole purpose of limiting people's food options. Obviously, they hate it when people can have anything for free and would do things like dump bleach all over expired food items so the homeless can't have them. These are the kinds of practices that don't benefit anyone in any material sense and exist only to transfer more of the public's money into the pockets of CEOs and should be cut, put a complete stop to. We need to shift our priorities away from the concerns of the market as an abstract entity and towards the needs of real people. And the more political power we acquire, the more we can actually bring the world to a truly democratic state, which is not at all what we have at present. Anyway. What I want to emphasize at this phase is the sharing of more large-scale properties. Certainly, it's nice to be able to share a tool here and there with a neighbor and use the things we already do own in a cooperative manner, but it's another thing to actually outline the use and scale of larger projects that everyone can derive a shared benefit from. A very basic concept, which is currently being somewhat undermined by the likes of BlackRock, which is a company that is literally just buying as much property as it can manage, would be bringing a systemic end to the concept of landlordism by actually pooling our money together to not rent, but purchase as much real estate property as we can manage, and then charging a form of rent only up to the point that that property is permanently paid off. In the long term, no one actually loses any money here, and then we can start to purpose those properties to house the most optimal amount of people. Which brings me to a main point of this phase that will be important to most of the younger generation, and that is, you can't afford a house. If you want to go to college, you already have too much debt. If you didn't go to college, you're never going to have the income. It's extremely sad, but almost no one today under the age of 30 is anywhere even close to be able to afford their own house. But I want to propose an alternative, something which I have even wanted to enter into willfully without any real ulterior economic motive, and that is shared housing. A lot of people, even to this day, maintain a semblance of the now century-old concept of the American dream, where they own an upscale house with three-car garage, bedrooms to spare, and probably way more acres of lawn than they know what to do with. Let me tell you something about myself. I have to my possession one bedroom, one bathroom, and a kitchen. And that is all I have any interest in pursuing in this life. I'm not going to have children. In fact, I'm somewhat opposed to the notion in general. If I ever do own a home, it will be minimal. And the only reason I would even personally bother with buying one is to save money, not for any kind of advancement in quality. Obviously, I'm extremely minimalistic, and I don't expect everyone to match everything I do. But the point is, it can be done, and this enables us to have at least partial ownership of our houses. I don't think it's nearly as important in the digital age to have a whole lot more than the basics, and if people can learn to live at least somewhat minimalistically, they can also learn to share housing, preferably with some people they might consider to be friendly with. Now I know some of you are already rolling your eyes at me, and that's fine. Again, I'm not asking everyone to live this way, I'm merely trying to create it as a more viable option to people who haven't considered this before 
or have considered it but haven't been able to follow through on any actual plans. And obviously, if someone changes their mind, maybe does want to have those three bedrooms in a good neighborhood to themselves one day, they can obviously just come to some arrangement where they are reimbursed and move out. And someone's ability to do this would be maintained as a viable option by the community's authority contractually. But anyway, the point is, the more things the people own, the less things that a company like BlackRock ends up owning, and the more leverage we have in society to do with that property what we want. I mean, just imagine if the people had a higher relative amount of wealth compared to the government and corporations. All power ultimately seems to come down to money. So the simplest way to reallocate power in the U.S. is to just bring the leverage of the institutions down a notch by spreading that power out to the people in a widespread way and also, as I've been saying, leverage that money effectually to give the people an institutional authority of their own. Once we start to do things like this and have enough of a network to become somewhat autonomous, we can then start to develop our very own currency. Possibly through crypto, though I believe a physical currency would also be good to have. And this would, by definition, make us something like our own country. Really. Once you start to use your own system of exchange, the government has a lot less power over your life and we can actually start to exhibit some authority of our own. At this point, any further ideas I would contribute myself start to become irrelevant because we're literally just doing our own thing and have become the ones who have the control. And that will bring us to the very last phase of this project. It's at this point that we need to render the government completely impotent. All of their propaganda networks should be replaced with a citizen's media, federal laws themselves will be rendered obsolete if deemed unuseful, and we can start to create wide-reaching systems of exchange that are maintained by our own free will, which is basic to the principles of anarchism. All of this can easily be accomplished through the simple act of mass non-compliance and peaceful disobedience. With enough momentum and concentrated effort, Really, anything is possible at this point, so it should make sense that if all is going well, we should try to expand operations to as many places as possible. Something of a note I'd like to use to expand the basic idea of purpose of this project is how it relates to my previously made political compass. The entire premise is basically moving us leftward on the compass, starting out with a kind of libertarianism, inching slowly into anarchist principles, and then once it's established itself with some firmness further to the left of our current anarcho-capitalist system, it can then become more or less customizable, in that we can tweak it to set the whole political apparatus about right where we want it to be. So rather than debating about what we want politically in this very abstract sense, we can narrow it down to a matter of simple, concrete questions we can ask ourselves about how we want to see society structured on this kind of a case-by-case, -case democratic basis. For just a brief explanation of how this works, the further left we go on the compass, the more the people are the ones who dictate the course of society. The power hierarchy becomes de-stratified. The higher up we go, the more that power becomes, let's say, authoritative, in that it becomes defined and given a focus, direction, and dictation. Which, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean it has to be more authoritarian in principle. Just that the power itself becomes more unilateral. And then obviously for the opposite directions, the opposite will be true. So that tangent aside, the purpose here of this whole movement is to, rather than usurping the government, and reorganize everything in one broad stroke to slowly pick apart the existing powers piece by piece until it loses all control over our lives. And all this is really entails is reminding people that they are the ones in power and giving them the means to collectively realize that. So phase four is less of a particular action and more of a goalpost that we have to keep pushing forwards towards uh, spreading the message and actionable ideology to as many people and places as possible. I would say it's important at this point to not make compromises with the existing government because they would at some point start to potentially see us as enough of a threat to want to put a stop to the movement by force or propaganda. We should settle for nothing less than a total democratic union controlled via the internet 
perhaps using delegates as well to represent larger bodies of people, to optimize our government structure and lay the groundwork of what should exist in the new era of freedom for humanity. I don't believe that the problems we face today are the natural results of a lack of resources or ability to make the world an equal and fair place where everyone can live as they desire, but simply the result of power-crazed individuals who refuse to use their power for good. And over time, given those reins of power back from those who hoard it currently, we will gradually start to see just how easy it was to create the world we want to see. So all this is just to say, the government does not have to have control over our lives. We can simply begin to do things to make the world better as we see fit. And if we can start to think about this a little more dynamically in terms of what we actually want to see happen, what we can do, then it would be very easy, I think, to get people to understand um, our ability to change the world is very much real and very much uh, manifestable. By doing this work and starting to really use the resources we have, the technology we have, uh, the ideas we have to make the world a better place, you will start to see that um, the existing power hierarchies are just completely malignant. We have never really needed them to exist. They're basically just placeholders. And their only functional purpose right now is just to prevent us from organizing society in a better way. Of course, it's hard to get people to actually care about things when it just seems so impossible to do, and it seems like, you know, um, these institutions are monoliths, but um, if you just take small steps and, you know, uh, do what you can with what you have and, you know, make it visible for people, um, encourage them to join you, uh, you can eventually really start a movement this way. It's very simple in concept, and um, it shouldn't have to be like this grandiose notion. It can just be like doing very small things, and then all these small things build together, and... After that goes on for long enough, with enough things, and bam, you've got a whole new world. You've got everything that, you know, we're allegedly aiming to achieve as a species. Apart from this video, which should serve as a general outline, I will also be making a video series on individual ideas and how we can effectively roll them out under the hashtag Virginia Wolf. Uh, maybe if you have your own ideas for the movement, you too can use this hashtag. Uh, I don't expect fast results or anything, but over time, I believe people will start to subscribe to this level of thinking more because it's the most realistic proposal I can think of for how to not just stop the existing corruption but to create a new world order of our very own. And when we do, we'll realize just how much better we can make things by working together. Mm -hmm.